Our second speaker is Constantino Grasso, who is an associate professor in business and law at Manchester Law School. You just heard him uh, introduce us all. He's also the founder and editor of the Corporate Crime Observatory and the Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ex Ethics Log. Uh, he has a particular specialty in whistleblowing uh, and has worked as a consultant and expert for the Council of Europe uh, and the Serious Fraud Office. And our final... Oh, hello. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. It's a pleasure to be with you today to present this uh, um, thoughts on uh, a very important and relevant issue. And when uh, um, we were thinking about uh, how to approach uh, the theme of the paradoxical approaches to whistleblowing, um, the point was to offer a presentation, uh, and my presentation will focus on the European uh, side, um, about uh, examples of this paradox. And so um, I would be a bit critical uh, in my presentation. Uh, and my presentation will focus on the adoption of the EU directive um, on the protection of whistleblowing. That is for sure a good standard uh, in terms of protection. But at the same time, I, I don't I want to overemphasize um, the positive aspect, but I will look at that in a critical way uh, to demonstrate uh, the complexity and the challenges that we faced uh, in order to adopt it. And, and uh, uh, all these obstacles uh, are emblematic, I think, of the paradox that we live in a society where on the one hand, whistleblowers are recognized publicly now as uh, heroes and people that basically play a vital role in uncovering illegal activities and safeguarding uh, democracy. But on the other hand, they are subject to retaliation for their courage and uh, even worse, they uh, experience a systemic reluctance from both uh, the authorities, so the public uh, sphere and private bodies like corporations to enact effective protective measures. Um, so we have to look at that and what are the, I will try to look at why we have this situation, what are the causes of such a situation that uh, seems paradoxical, seems because I don't think actually it's a real paradox. Um, now, as I said, uh, on October 20, uh, 2019, the EU uh, finally adopted uh, the gold standard of protection of whistleblowers uh, um, in the European Union, uh, that is the EU uh, Whistleblowing Directive. It was approved with a uh, vast majority, 591 uh, voting in favor against uh, only 29 votes. So what is the purpose? That's an important point. The purpose of this directive, uh, because it's an instrument that then the states can implement with specific legislation, is not to set uh, the uh, standard themselves uh, as they should be applied, but only to lay down the common minimum standards. That means that there is no prejudice uh, for the member states to extend the protection under national law, uh, for example, to uh, protect uh, cases not covered uh, by the directive. And this is because, of course, the directive, the scope of application of the directive is, of course, limited to the competence of the EU. So there are so many areas that are only covered by national law where, of course, only the member states could extend the protection offered by the directive. The directive is not applicable to that uh, areas. And also, uh, there is a possibility to go beyond the, the minimum standards uh, offered by the directive, uh, implementing a higher level of standard for whistle of protection. So that was what we expected. Uh, but we also knew that there would, uh, would have been the tendency just to stick with the common minimum standards. And that's the part of the paradox that we have to speak about. 
why is that? Now everybody says that they're heroes. Why we do not go, ex, you know, extra mile to uh, basically protect them? So as an example of why this uh, directive is so good, uh, is that uh, it also let the protection be applied where relevant, not only to the whistleblowers themselves, but to facilitators. It is a quite a big term, but to really include them, for example, lawyers, of course, that help the um, whistleblowers. There could be also third person connected with the reporting persons that may separate retaliation in a work-related context, such as colleagues and relatives. And this is important because what we have seen is that one form of retaliation is the fact that the person after blowing the whistle is totally isolated by everybody. So this kind of extension to colleagues of this protection is trying to create a different environment, a different culture uh, happening when, of course, somebody blow the whistle. And also to legal entities that are connected to the uh, person that can be retaliated against um, in terms of uh, uh, business, for example, activities. Now, even more importantly, another, I think, uh, part of the right that I like so much is that it also um, provides effective proportionate and dissuasive penalties. Uh, I mean, it doesn't provide this, but obliges the state to provide them that are applicable to natural legal person that uh, try to hinder or attempt to hinder reporting, take retaliatory me measures, bring uh, proceedings that are, you know, just uh, draconian or breach the duty of maintaining the confidentiality. So there is also a sanctioning aspect that, uh, you know, can be applied. And uh, uh, even if uh, it is not established that this uh, sanction has to be criminal in nature, but they have to be using the, the common approach usually, it's usually used at the international level, they have to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. And also, Article 24, the directive says that there is no possibility uh, to waive the rights, the remedies in the direct in any way. Uh, so this, this uh, um, remedies and rights may not be waived or limited by any agreement, policy, forms, or condition of employment. So this is very important because this is basically making void all the forms of uh, NDAs, the non-disclosure agreement that usually um, the corporation let you know employees sign to try to silence them or to let them after the blowing the whistle they let you know try to let them uh, sign to stop the reputation damage and and the contain the 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 issue that have been raised. Now, so these are the good things. And I told you, I don't want to overemphasize them. I just wanted to share with you some of the most interesting aspects of the directive, why I consider it a, a, a gold standard. But in reality, what is frequently overlooked is how we reach that kind of uh, gold standard. We actually face major obstacles in Europe in order to uh, obtain this kind of protection. And it shouldn't be there. This is part of the paradox. It's, it's true that they are vital to fight economic crime. If it's true that they are heroes, if it's true that, that they protect democracy, why we found so much resistance and reluctance for the adoption of this uh, directive. So what I will try now to do is to show you this kind of obstacles, what we faced. Uh, and it was there because, of course, uh, there were competing uh, interests of business representatives, especially relating to sectors such as the banking sector, which have faced a numerous cases of reporting concerns, um, and they tended to oppose uh, these increased transparency regimes, because of course, if you protect the whistleblowers, uh, what you uh, have as a result is a, a higher level of transparency, and they don't want this kind of transparency because unfortunately, and everybody knows, I mean, and I'm saying somebody that is not discussed, uh, the financial system has big problems in terms of the money laundering and uh, using the money that comes from criminal activities or uh, 
uh, involvement in uh, aggressive tax avoidance and tax emission schemes. And of course, uh, the transparency there uh, is very problematic. And this is a bit, a bit the problem that we are facing with, you know, the uh, adoption of uh, the beneficial ownership uh, registers and how there is reluctance to make them open to the public, even the the uh, court uh, of the European Union uh, intervened to say that there should be limited to the public um, dissemination of this data that of course is, is fundamental in a democratic society. So yeah, so this is an example of this kind of competing interest that we have there. Um, now, William Goodall, uh, a lawyer, uh, a top lawyer, international lawyer who represented among others, uh, um, very relevant uh, legal services lawyer like Edmund Falciani, the HSBC one, Antoine Del Tor, the Lux Leaks with the Rui Pinto, the Football and Wanda Leaks with the uh, he explained that in his uh, meeting uh, in Paris with the top bankers, uh, he explained that he realized how the enemies of whistleblowers, and, and mentioned in his own words, that are recorded on the corporate social responsibility blog. If you'd like to have access to this recording, just you know, you can uh, search on Google William Bourdon, Bourdon, the corporate social responsibility blog. And uh, I'll contact me, I can give you the, the address. So basically, he said the enemies of whistleblowers are organizing the counter offensive. Uh, through lobbying in Brussels and Strasbourg, asking parliamentarians, for example, to criminalize the violation of business circles, and they would like to use the protection of business circles as a way to keep uh, uh, things uh, under a shroud of mystery and not adopt a re regime of transparency. And so it's a misuse, of course, of uh, business secret uh, rules. And uh, also, when he met some corporate leaders in the financial sector, they said that to him that even if now there is this directive and they are obliged to protect whistleblowers, uh, they will go ahead with this, the retaliation thing. So they prefer to find the guy, I mean, the whistleblowers, they said, who reveals, for example, laundering and pay damages, but this will be done only after 10 years of struggle, legal battle. He's unemployable now and he has to fight 10 years of battle. And I, I don't know, we are so rich that we can pay our lawyers and they're uh, very good lawyers that can do whatever it takes to delay or suffocate the proceedings. Because what is the purpose actually is not to win the case, they will lose the case, that's important, but to use this kind of retaliatory measures as a way to deter the other one to do the same. So this is also related to, in the paradox we are speaking about, we have also another issue that is emerging and is the slap techniques. So the silencing the public participation techniques. So basically it's the distortion of justice, the misuse of legal instrument and cases to deter uh, public participation. So these are very serious problems that our democracy is facing. And uh, um, yeah, we have to be critical. We have to speak about them. These are things that we have to be very well aware of and we have to react to this, I think. Now, so it was, uh, uh, now it won't surprise you after this promise that I've made uh, that the European Commission for several years decided not to go ahead with the project uh, for the protection of whistleblowers because they were citing that there was a lack of EU competences and the council, and you know now the council is the representative of governments, so the ministers, uh, or the prime ministers, so uh, is the executive. Uh, so they basically, uh, shared uh, similar skepticism, and they said that they basically many states lack the national laws to protect that, so they end up to go ahead. Only It was only the European Parliament uh, that uh, enjoyed in that very period of time, so, so, so the, the, the serendipity here is important, uh, it enjoyed, uh, you know, a strong presence of Greens and the European uh, Free Alliance, and they were the driver for a change, and they decided to, to urge the European Commission, because they can, the Parliament can urge the European Commission to propose a whistleblower directive. So there was this push for the Parliament. So uh, uh, the European Commission had to act, because the Parliament, of course, is, you know, is uh, 
uh, should be supreme even at the EU le level because it's, it's made, you know, the parliament uh, has the direct you know, representation of the people in Europe. So the commission finally adopted in 2018 uh, a proposal for this directive. Uh, however, it was in a very broad stage and it was very ineffective. So, so that's another point that we have to analyze. So, so the, uh, even if uh, under, you know, the push of the European Parliament, the, the European Commission, at the very end, eventually, they decided to come out with the proposal was very bad. I mean, it was not really protecting, and it had important some crucial controversial provisions that had to be amended. You know, uh, were not so. Why the Commission proposed something like this? And that's still because of the influence of the lobbying of the powers, the economic powers, and they don't want an untransparency because an untransparency for them is not good for business because some obscure kind of business that are very lucrative, uh, they, they cannot be transparent at the same time. So in particular, one important point of contention that was very, very, you know, as an example that I can give you that, you know, it's, it's so emblematic of the struggle was that um, how they had to establish the priority of uh, reporting channels that the whistleblower says to use in order to be protected. And uh, they establish a very strict uh, prioritization of reporting channels. Just basically, the proposal said um, that in order to be protected, so if this order was not followed, there was no protection for the whistleblower. First, the whistleblower had to blow the whistle internally. Then, if there was no uh, a positive outcome of them. He had to report externally to the authorities, and only if both of this reporting was not you know, um, resulting in an appreciable outcome, he had the possibility to go to the public and, for example, contact the media. And so it was a very strict three um, level approach. Uh, that was also favored by the European Union Council, again, unsurprisingly, but is totally detached from the reality. We know very well that the vast majority of whistleblowers, they just first report naturally internally, and that's why they, sub they are subject to retaliation, and they are sidelined, and they are uh, and the corporation that receive this kind of information try their best to hide things, so it has no sense in reality to let them necessarily in every case in order to be protected to first report internally is a way to let them expose to retaliation and also is a way to let the corporation be able to cut time to dissimulate the facts or cover up the facts. In an ideal world, this could have worked, but we don't live in an ideal world. And I would actually mention the fantastic word of Senator Grassley in the United States in 2019 that said, in a perfect world, organizations will value input for their employees, work to fix the problems they identify and go about their business. But as he said, we do not live in a perfect world. This is not the reality. So, Luckily, the European Parliament was very strong here because we risked a lot with this kind of uh, provision. And uh, backed by uh, 80 organizations and uh, we support uh, civil society NGOs, uh, the Parliament demanded a more flexible approach and said, this has to change. This is the touch from the value. This is not giving any protection really to we support. This is so... Uh, a draconic kind of privatization and you know you just want to safeguard business you are not to safeguard the person that we need the most that are you know the honest whistleblower that give us so so uh such important information so because of that eventually not eventually in the debate because we had still uh, that serendipity effect so we were still with a good parliament there uh, the uh, directive was a uh, proposal was amended, and now we have a system that is more reasonable. And I like it. The solution is an intermediate solution. So basically, right now, the, in the final version, it was approved. 
um, basically there is no uh, order of priority between internal um, reporting and external to the authorities. So the whistleblower is protected if uh, whatever it does. Uh, and also there is the possibility of direct uh, uh, reporting to media or to the public in specific circumstances that are quite interesting. And basically when the person has a reasonable grounds to believe that the breach may cost it an imminent manifestation to the public interest, and in the case, and or, it's important, or in the case in which there is a risk of retaliation or a low prospect that the breach being uh, addressed due to the particular circumstances of the case. Now, of course, this is very vague uh, provision and uh, why so vague in a particular circumstances of the case? the reason one is of course because it can then capture so many different circumstances but also because you know it was not uh, proper uh, even directly the, the most uh, the probable the, the most probable uh circumstance that would be a, a collusion between the corporate power and authorities that can be you know a situation that will do not let the the disclosure have any effect. And of course, they did have the possibility to write this black and white in the letter of the directive. But uh, of course, this is the cases there, the very few cases like that. And it's important also to look that uh, uh, here is important that you know he, the whistleblower does not need to have the proof of this, but it's important that he has uh, a reasonable ground to believe. So the belief of whistleblower, of whistleblower is important to be protected in these cases. This is very important point that we have to look at. So, uh, so this case actually demonstrates not only the importance of uh, supranational oversights that we can have. So basically, sometimes government in a nation, uh, in a country, you know, are in an impasse because they, 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 there is so much conflict of interest that there and the status quo is so strong that they cannot achieve a protection at the national level. Uh, and then only at the transnational level, supranational level, actually, a supranational level, is it possible to reach, you know, uh, such forms of protection from transparency and it's so important that in the European Union, uh, the countries, they enjoy two level of protection uh, uh, and the uh, oversight, you know, the one from the European Union and also the one from the Council of Europe that is even a big, uh, bigger organization, but all the members of the EU are also members of the Council of Europe. So we have two uh, sort of national bodies that check on and how the rule of law is applied in the countries and what are the problems of this country. So, uh, and this is of course a growing effect. So we are, we are, they are intervening more and more and this is very important to break the impasse that we have uh, because of the status quo at the national level. Um, so now, Again, not to be surprised for many years, the directive has not been implemented, uh, but then uh, uh, the, the, the basically the deadline of 2021 for the implementation was not respected. Now we are, we are in 2024, and uh, basically uh, the law has been adopted by many states, only two states, Estonia and Poland, have not yet adopted the implementation. Of, Three years after the deadline, not, not after the direct 2019. So the deadline was, was of two years, so they've still there, have to adopt the law. But more interesting if you look at that, even if the law has been adopted, as you said to us, uh, in 2024, uh, at the beginning of 2024, no state has transposed it. And transpose means even if the law has been adopted, it's not yet effective. So it's for example, they're waiting for uh, a publicity uh, period or uh, there is a delay uh, between the adoption of the law and its um, effective implementation. So at the moment, it's still not used in any state. So it, this is incredible if you think that it was in 2019 and now we are in 2024. 
So the directive introduced common minimum standards uh, for the protection of whistleblowers. Uh, we said, and that was an important part of the discussion, and uh, without prejudice for uh, the states to the possibility to extend this protection. So did they done it? This is, again, another element that we can evaluate to understand the paradox that we're speaking about. Um, if you look at what said, uh, the Chairman of Transparency International Denmark said uh, during uh, uh, the Virtue, uh, that is a research project that I led, uh, workshop and is published on the Corporate Crime of Several. You can uh, listen to this uh, event. In Denmark, uh, we have recently implemented the EU whistleblower directive at the national level. The choice has been to offer the same level of protection without announcing it. So, so I, even Denmark, in, in, in the transparency, um, international index is number one together with uh, the perception of corruption index of so transparency international is number one together with uh, New Zealand. They didn't go beyond the, the basic possession of the directive. This is emblematic, no? Uh, and then uh, what happened to, in Italy is amazing. So in, in I mean, not in a nice way. So basically, um, in 2022, so after so many years, uh, finally the, the Council of Ministers approved the legislative decree aimed at transposing the, the provision of the directive in the Italian legal system. And the, the regional bill, it uh, broadened the scope of the protection, so it did not apply enhanced protections, but uh, just apply the minimum standards, not only to the matter regulated by the uh, European Union, but also to the violation of Italian law. It, I mean, it makes uh, sense, I mean, of course. I mean, uh, you want to protect the state, so why you have to put it on only transparency when it's related to the opinion? It's, it's, it, it, it was a quite, you know, uh, it made sense. But then the, the parliament discussion, the, the, the parliament and its final approved version in March 2033, 2023, they narrowed down again the protection and now is basically a, a uh, applicable the Italian legislation based on the directive only to matter concerned in the European Union. So we didn't have any uh, extended protection, we didn't have any enhanced protection, and so what happens now, in, when it, this will be uh, effective, because still the period of, uh, we are waiting for the concrete uh, effectiveness, but basically a whistleblower that uh, report the things that are related to Italian law and not the EU law uh, won't be protected. And uh, this is, you know, this is what's happening. So this is an example. This is so illustrative of the paradox. Now, very, very recently, I read about the whistleblower of uh, the Wirecard uh, scandal. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, he said the same thing about Germany. He said, okay, German law, uh, that adopted the directive, implemented the directive. It resulted from a political compromise, and uh, basically there is still a, a sort of uh, employees against business, and this is the, the perspective used, so the law is very weak. It's too weak uh, as implemented. And this is another issue that is now is emerging, the cultural issue here. Uh, so that's why they are retaliated against. That's why we say, and never uh, become, they become basically uh, unemployable. And this is because there is the tendency to see the business world as, you know, a world that is in conflict with their employees, the best employees that they have, because they are the best. I mean, they, we suppose are the best employees that you can have because they are the ones that you know, are trying to make your company uh, clear and uh, legal. So, so they should be promoted, they should be priced, not basically retaliated against and put off the market. So what's happening in reality is that we are losing because of this tendency, the best people we have, and they, they cannot, they won't let them work anymore, whereas we keep in the business, the people that just follow it and serve him loyalty in a, in a critical manner or even with a collision way, uh, the potential misconduct that they are in the corporation. And of course, this has consequences on the environment that we 
is, is, is that pattern, the pattern. Okay. And also it's interesting that transparency international uh, said that the, you know, in the implementation of the directive, they verified that there is a lack of general uh, protection of whistleblowers who report uh, corruption, in particular corruption. And this is not to be, um, again, it's not surprising because, you know, corruption is so important. Uh, and when you speak about corruption, usually there is a, a, a uh, and the status quo is affected, and and so they they hate transparency. Transparency and corruption are you know enemies. I mean, if corruption thrives in secrecy, and so this is what happens there. And and and, and you know, it's um, when I made a, um, an analysis of about the journalists in the city, journalists are many journalists uh, are killed unfortunately in their. Um, during their job, because of their job, okay? And if you look at the statistics there, you will see that the, the ones that are killed because of they were investigating corruption are more than the ones that are killed because they were investigating all the other crimes, all the other crimes, including organized crimes. So this is to let you understand how much corrupt uh, individuals, the corrupt elite hates the crimes. So, it's the, you know, it's, it's that's why we have this fund. It's one of the reasons. And they also said that none of the 20 countries said as far as international that they examined fully meets the best uh, practice. So this is the situation now. I mean, this is still very bad. Now, I will finish here trying to reason with you uh, about this paradox and what are the reasons that lie uh um here and in a in a way i will try to uh this is this is a work that i've done i was reflecting on this and this is coming out in a chapter i wrote in the book uh, with the voice of, um, the voices of justice that would be soon hopefully um published by springer international so i say is basically what i say is that um this is an apparent paradox because there are reasons. So, so it's, it's a logical uh, uh, situation that we can just look at. Why is that? So we are facing three dimensions of problems. The first one is a deep cultural difficulty. Um, in our culture, and you know, we, we have uh, gathered evidence of that, basically, we consider disclosures in a derogatory term. Snitching is bad. You don't do it. You know, you, you won't have any friend if you do like this. Uh, this is, yeah, yeah. you don't have to do this. And uh, also, even more importantly, for even prosecutors, we always tend to overemphasize the motivation behind the, the disclosure rather than the disclosure itself and the facts that are important in the disclosure. And of course, this kind of looking at the motivation, why the whistleblower blew the whistle, is a way that exposes the entire system to uh, close. And in particular, that's why, because of this cultural tendency that we have, uh, corporations and the part that are affected by the disclosure, they always start smear campaigns, paying investigators, they look at the private life of the whistleblowers to, to, to you know, to demolish in a way, uh, to, to, to put them data their reputation and then say, so what they say is not true. I mean, it's not important the personal life of the whistleblower. <laughs> Did you do this, Ms. These are the parts that they have to put. I don't have to look at what, you know, what are the habits of the whistleblower. You know, there are no saints on earth, okay? We don't have to believe the whistleblower saint. Uh, and uh, luckily, you know, the this kind of idea that we have to disregard the, the personal motivation and belief of the whistleblower is finally um, being accepted and uh, also in the one of the latest uh, United Nations declaration, it was just said that this, uh, you know, I think at the end of last year, that basically is not important the motivation. It's not something we have to emphasize, it's not relevant. We want to look at what are the facts on which, you know, the uh, disclosure is based. 
The second dimension is our organizational challenges and self-presentation. So this is natural. I mean, uh, what is the tendency of an organization, a corporation, why corporation they rated this? Why corporation they don't like this? Let's see the reality. They don't like this. They, 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 uh, they consider them their enemies, as, as the what Carlos Bo said. Why is that? Is that because they look and they perceive the, uh, the disclosure only from a negative perspective? So they don't look at it as something important that they merge and can help them to become a, a, a better organization. Uh, the vast majority of the case, uh, that's the reality. I mean, the, this can help, you know, this kind of uh, disclosure can help the organization to grow. Uh, but they look at only the negative consequences. So what are they? They look at that, the fact that because of this disclosure, there would be the imposition of sanctions. There should be uh, changes within the organization and internal structure, department and organization. Some colleagues are still fired and, you know, the, the, the life would be, you know, if they were involved in the discount, of course, the life would be ruined. Um, they can be, so, so, so there would be punishment for employees. There can be a reputation of damage and this can be asymmetric. So, uh, why you know we are you know our competitors, so there could be also a competitive disadvantage. Our competitors were not subject to a, 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 a disclosure like that, so they even if they do the same thing, they are not losing any market share. But because we have this whistleblower here, we are now suffering with this reputation and damage, and and these kind of things are the one that overemphasized. So the solution is that you know who has to be punished is the whistleblower, but of course. This is the part of the paradox, but it's also based on an instinct of self-preservation. So we understand it. So we have to change this kind of perception within the corporations of this kind and the other departments, also the public departments. And I mean, public departments are even worse because in other, in other like the military, uh, other areas where the hierarchical structure is very, very uh, strict, uh, you know, this kind of perception is even more negative. And finally, maybe the, the, the a point that the legal uh, studies is not so much uh, look at that they test to be explored much more is that, that this kind of uh, um, reluctance to protect whistleblower is that because they need to want to protect the status quo. Let's say it very bluntly. So in, uh, in every state, even in democracies, we have a dominant the political class, uh, the rich, people, the 1%, we can call them in any way, and they represent the result of how power is handled at the national level, meaning that the politician could be essentially seen as the reflection of this social order. So when a whistleblower blow the whistle, demonstrate corruption, demonstrate that this, you know, the dominant class has privilege they shouldn't have, and there is, you know, this kind of web of a relationship that is, you know, a dark web, what they do, they distract the status quo. So they did because the result of this is uh, a travel for a change. The change means that the dominant class should, you know, do not get some of the privileges that they are enjoying, but they shouldn't. And of course, they don't want to lose any privilege in a society. And this is the problem, no? And this is also related to the uneven distribution of power in society. If more, uh, if the power is distributed in a very uneven way, of course the protection of the status quo is strong. So uh, of course, when uh, the civil somebody from the civil society uh, is blowing the whistle, we can see that there's an intentional disregard, political resistance from the elite to this kind of disclosure. And this is why it's happening. So uh, this will under my final thoughts, I hope.